Hi everyone and welcome to this weekend's Q&A session. For those of you who are new to these videos, I answer your questions throughout the weekend and then publish this video on a Monday. Now there are various ways you can get me questions. The first way is via my Patreon campaign. There's a link in the video description. And my Patreon campaign gives you various perks in exchange for your support. And one of those perks is priority on your questions. The other two ways are also detailed in the video description. You can tweet your questions at Geekanoids using the hashtag GeekQA, or you can send in donations if you request a shout out for perhaps your website or your YouTube channel or your Twitter account, etc. All the details you need are in the video description. So anyway, let's get on with the questions. The first one I've got here is from Moomin Hamid. Hey Dave, awesome videos as always. Thank you very, very much. I really do appreciate that. My question is, what do you hope to see in 2014 for the Mac lineup, from the desktop Macs to the MacBooks? Thanks, Dave. Stay awesome. Well, that is an awesome question. And for this year, I'm not sure we're going to see too many changes in the Mac lineup. I think we will see a, a revision in the iMacs, and the only changes we'll probably see there is just a boost in performance. We're not going to see anything new in the Mac Pro lineup because obviously the new Mac Pro has only just been launched. With regards to MacBooks, MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs, I don't think they're going to be able to do much with the MacBook Pro lineup. But with the MacBook Air, I really am hoping that they make the move this year to Retina displays. For a long, long time now, MacBook Airs have sort of lagged behind because they've still got this lower resolution display. And I think that's one of the main areas that I really do think they can improve things. The other thing I'm really looking forward to, not directly in relation to your question, is new iPads. I'm hoping they do create this larger iPad uh, with some sort of keyboard dock. Apple haven't done this before, and I think it will be a new product category. In a way, it's still going to be in the iPad category, but it's going to be going into direct competition with things like the Microsoft Surface Pro 2, and also a lot of these other tablets that do come with these keyboard dock combinations. And I think Apple could do it really well. So I'm hoping they do enter that space. So brilliant question. Next question is from Donny. Uh, Hi Dave, I'm back again with another question. Earlier I asked about which iPad to get. And now I realise that I'm almost never using my iPad. Should I sell my iPad Mini 1 and get a better iPhone? The I phone I have now is an iPhone 4, so I could use an upgrade. I could just get a 4S off Amazon without selling my Mini but would it be wiser to sell it if I don't use it and get an iPhone 5S using the money? Thanks in advance, Jer the Geek. Awesome username. So that is a really good question, and I think you've sort of answered it yourself because you're saying you don't use your iPad. Well, if you don't use it, sell it while it's still got some value in it. There's no point in having gadgets and technology just sitting there gathering dust, so I would definitely consider getting rid of that iPad and investing in the iPhone 5S instead. That said, think about your choice of smartphone. If you got the iPhone 5S, would you really use all of its extra features? So what I'm trying to get you to think about is, would you perhaps be able to go in the middle ground and go for an iPhone 5C instead if you're not going to use the extra features that are in the 5S? So something worth considering, but really good question. And, and in summary, I would always say this to people, Unless you're keeping technology like, for example, I do, so I can do comparisons between products. If you're a user of the technology and you've got something gathering dust, sell it while it's still got some value. That's the best thing you can do. And then I've got a question here via Twitter, and this is from Alexandra Paranormal. Uh, my Thompson router keeps losing Wi-Fi connection to my iPad 2, but not to my iPhone 4S or anything else. Any advice? That is a really difficult question to troubleshoot. It could be something uh, that maybe a member of your family is using that when it connects to your router, it's sort of kicking other uh, products or other connections off the router. It could be something like that. It could be something to do with the type of security setting you've got on your router. It could be something to do with the channel setting you've got as well. If you've got it set to automatic, maybe look at changing that to a fixed channel and see if that corrects the problem. You're going to have to do some just trial and error yourself. So I would try changing channel settings first, then maybe having a look at the security settings and also just seeing what other members of family are using and see if something that happens within your household 
invokes this sort of action where your product gets kicked off of the connection. That's the best I can do really. It's down to you really to troubleshoot that the best you can. So today I am in DIY mode. So I'm gonna be painting some skirting boards because it needed doing for a long, long time. So at the moment I'm just wiping them down and getting off any dirt and dust. Just gradually updating the decor in the house so that eventually, in probably about two, three years time, we will actually move and we won't have to do it all in one go. Now, as you all know, I absolutely hate DIY, but these jobs have to be done. So this is a white satin paint. And this has not been painted in here for a long, long time. So my weekend is pretty busy because apart from obviously I've done the video going onto the channel this morning, I've also had to um, get the Patreon video ready, which is a new uh, mini gadget collection. And then I've also had to take my daughter to work. because She works on a Saturday. And then later on today, I'm doing the live broadcast for taking questions about the editing room. And then on top of all that, I do my weekend Q&A session video. And the Q&A session video I thoroughly enjoy doing because it's just uh, it's just really nice to answer these tech questions that you all leave for me. I really do enjoy it, and it means that the weekend's pretty busy. So, pretty much the only time I get to have a real sort of uh, I don't know sort of relaxing time is on a Sunday. And if we go anywhere on Sunday, I will share that with you in a video as well. So. This is going to probably take two coats. You can see where the previous person, this isn't me, the previous person's painted it round here and got it all over the door, which is not fantastic. But anyway, this isn't going to be perfect, but it is going to make it look a lot better than it did. So it's just coming up to half past four on Saturday and I've been preparing for the live broadcast on YouTube which would have already happened by the time you watch this, but basically that's happening at 6 p.m. on Saturday, so you can watch the recording of that if you haven't seen it already. It's the first broadcast I've done from the editing room since I did all the changes. And I did have to take something apart though, I was having issues with audio levels, and every time I put the audio levels up to an acceptable level for what I was getting from my meters and from my monitoring through the headphones, there was some sort of background hum that I just wasn't happy with and I like clean audio. So I have switched microphones temporarily and taken the audio interface out of the equation because I think it's the Focusrite Forte that's causing the problems. Might not be the interface, might just be a cable, but I haven't got time to troubleshoot it for this first broadcast. So I've had to just sort of switch microphones. But because I'm so busy, I'm not gonna answer any more of your questions today. I'm gonna to leave those until tomorrow but it's going to be in this very same video because, as you know, this is a weekend long Q&A session. So I hope you've had a brilliant Saturday and you'll be watching this on Monday, though. I always keep forgetting that. I address you as though you're watching this as I'm recording it. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Stay tuned because there's some more questions coming up next. Hi, everyone. It is now Sunday and I've got some more questions coming. And the reason I'm in the editing room is because some of the questions relate to the editing room. So let's go on with the first one. It's coming via email, it comes from somebody called John. It says, I'm taking my father up to Lincoln in two weeks time for a surprise birthday treat. The treat is a ride in a Lancaster bomber up and down the runway, not taking off, but even so a very special day. Wow, that is amazing. That is a really awesome birthday treat. I want to capture the day, but I'm unsure whether to go for a camcorder or a camera that I can also record video with. Also, I hope to keep the kit 
as I have three young children and would love to be able to make some videos of them and also get some great pictures as they grow up. If possible, can you suggest a budget, mid-range and top end so I can spend a week or so looking at them myself and justifying spending extra if need be? Also, any bits of kit that would make using the kit easier, i.e. tripod or a means to carry the kit? Once again, many thanks and keep up the great work. Wow, that is a very good question. Now, there are a few ways you could approach this. You could approach this with a single piece of kit or perhaps two pieces of kit. So I'm gonna suggest quite a lot of things within the answer, but I hope it sort of makes sense. Now, if you're gonna go real budget end uh, and you wanna keep the cost down to a minimum, then look at the Canon PowerShot range. Uh, maybe a 280 HS or something along those lines or maybe even a Sony WX300 now that will keep the cost quite low and then you've got a compact camera uh, much like what I'm recording this video on that's capable of capturing nice photographs uh, also capturing good quality video and also it will keep the cost really at, at a bare minimum and it's going to be very very portable something you can stick in your pocket quite easily so that would be my first suggestion. Now you asked about products that you might want to take along with that. Well there's these little sort of furry windshields, I've covered them on the channel. I think they're called Windjammers by Ryko. And you can stick those over the microphones on cameras and that cuts out some of the wind noise. Now you say you're not actually taking off but you're still probably going to be going into an airfield for example. And unless the wind's perfectly still, unless you've got a really awesome day, then I would definitely stick those on the camera because it will cut down on that wind noise, which is very distracting when you're watching video back. And then if you're planning on using this later on to capture maybe footage when you go out for walks or maybe you go to a beach uh, or in the countryside, for example, the UK is windy. So these little wind jammers are a really good idea to purchase. Now, you want to go up to mid-range. So maybe I would look at a mid-range camcorder for ease of use, something in the Panasonic V range, or also in the mid-range, check out some Micro Four Thirds cameras. Now I use a Panasonic uh, Lumix DMC G6. That's sort of top end of the mid-range, but you can also get a GF6. Now the reason I'm suggesting this is because it takes absolutely awesome photos and when you come to uh, sort of experimenting with your style of photography, you might find you want a different lens. You might find you want to do maybe some wildlife photography if you go to visit zoos, etc. Or maybe you're even going on a safari and you want to take wildlife photos. So the fact you can swap the lenses out and get something with a longer reach might well be worth considering. Also, don't just stick to the Panasonic range. I use an Olympus OMD EM1, which is a top end micro four thirds camera. You can also look at the EM5 and the EM10 from Olympus and the picture quality you'll get for photos is absolutely awesome. So really do consider those. Not quite so good for video but still very very good video indeed. So check those out. They're a little bit more tricky to use for capturing video but they do autofocus. Sometimes they hunt in and out a little bit with autofocus but well worth considering. Now, I'm going to throw in a curveball here, a little bit of a wild card for you. When I suggested that low end and the middle end option, if your budget allows, maybe get the compact camera and something like a GoPro. Because if you've got young children and you're going to the beach, for example, and you want something you can stick in a waterproof case and not worry about getting damaged, the GoPro, GoPro Hero 3 Plus Black Edition, for example, is absolutely awesome. It does take photos, not fantastic photos, but acceptable, and the video footage you'll capture will be great fun for your children to look back on for many, many years to come. So throw that into the equation as well and just tie up whether you can afford to get two, or maybe you can just get a GoPro Hero 3 Plus, and that will do everything you want, uh, apart from maybe not doing quite so well on actual photos. And you also asked for a high-end option. Well, high-end, you can go as, as high as you want on price, as you know. You could go, go for a Canon 5D Mark III, but I certainly wouldn't be using that as a carry-around-everywhere camera. If I was choosing a camera to fit in with 
within what you've actually asked for but to deliver a bit more i would really suggest my panasonic lumix dmc g6 i think it offers the best of both worlds and i don't think you need to spend any more money than that it delivers brilliant quality video you see the video quality that i put on the channel and it also has interchangeable lenses and it takes great photos now if you didn't want to swap out lenses here's another suggestion for you the camera i'm using at the moment the sony rx100 mark ii brilliant for both photos and videos it's got a nice long reach on the zoom lens as well and it might be just the only camera you need so i know i've given you a lot of mixed messages there but you really need to think do i want one camera that's going to just last me for a long time do i want to change lenses do i want something that's waterproof and then take all of those factors into consideration it might point you to one of the cameras i mentioned in this answer so brilliant question and have a fantastic day. That is an awesome treat for your dad. So I'm going to go to another question now. Sorry about the long answer there, but it really justified it. Uh, this question comes from Matt Pegler on Twitter. Will you be getting a Moto 360 smartwatch to review uh, Android Wear? I hopefully will be getting one of those in. Motorola have normally been pretty good uh, to me. Uh, with actually sending in product to review. So hopefully I will bring you a review of that when they become available. Now, I said I've got questions that related to the editing room. I have indeed. The couple of questions I got, one of them was regarding the microphone I used for yesterday's live stream. And the other one was regarding this acoustic foam. So I'm just gonna come around behind the camera and just show you this acoustic foam. Now the question I had was why have I left gaps in the foam here here there's also a gap over there as well now there is a good reason for that when i first installed this there was also a gap in here there was a triangular gap behind the microphone and i tested the acoustics and i was still getting some reverberation and I, so i filled in this gap with foam as well and that really helped purely because it was behind the microphone i swing this microphone out when in use uh, but it really helped just sort of uh, sort of equalise the acoustics and I stopped getting that, there was a tiny little bit of echo still coming through. Now the reason I didn't fill in the sections here, here and here is because if you use too much acoustic foam, I've even got some white space just over on this right hand side as well, just by the light switch there. Uh, the reason I didn't fill in all of the gaps is because then the sound would have become too sort of deadened, it would have sounded too flat and it wouldn't have really given a sort of a, a richness to my voice. So uh, not that I want to make my voice sound any different than it actually is, but it really would have just made it sound very, very dull and with no characteristics to the audio that I'm recording. And don't forget, this foam is designed for use in recording studios. So it's not just for my voice, not just to make me sound good. You, you've got to install it in a certain manner that it just equalizes the acoustics of the room. Now, whilst we're over in this area, this is the microphone that I used for the live stream last night. Now, the reason I switched to this mic uh, was because I had the Rode NT1 connected to the Forte uh, audio interface, the Focusrite Forte, which was down there in that gap there. But I was getting some echo coming through in the audio. Now, I've tested the Rode microphone with my other audio interface just down here, the Tascam US 600. I tested that this morning and it's absolutely fine. So it's definitely not the microphone. It was the Focusrite interface, which I think I've just got here. Let me just grab it. This was the culprit. So this uh, Focusrite Forte was causing issues with the uh, sort of the audio buzz or hum that I was getting coming through in the audio. So I switched them out before I started the live broadcast and used the USB microphone for that first one. When I do the next live broadcast on YouTube, I'm going to switch back to the Rode NT1 because it's an awesome microphone. I'm going to use that with the Tascam, Tascam US600 audio interface. So that's just a couple of questions that came in after I'd finished that live broadcast. Absolutely thoroughly enjoyed doing that, uh, the, the live broadcast as well. I haven't done that for a long, long time. And it was just great to see all the questions coming in. So I will do that again in the near future. So it's now Sunday evening and I'm speaking a little bit quieter because I've developed a little bit of a sore throat. So I'm going to continue anyway and answer a couple more questions that came in. The first one is from Andrew who asks, what sound setup do you have and TV and what made you choose it? 
Now that's a really good question. The actual TV I've got is an LG 47 inch TV. It's nothing fancy. It does support uh, 3D, although I don't use the 3D feature that much. The uh, amplifier that I've got, or the receiver, is an Arcam FMJ AVR 400. I chose Arcam because it's a little bit of a step up from the mainstream brands. And I think because of the actual construction, the circuitry, uh, the attention to detail they actually pay to things like sound processing, I think it actually delivers a much nicer sound. Uh, something that's more encompassing as well, so it certainly engages me a lot more when I'm watching a movie or a film. And I've also got an Oppo Blu-ray player. I said that weird, Oppo. Oppo, it's one of those words, the more you say it, the weirder it sounds. But yes, I've got an Oppo Blu-ray player. And again, I used to use my PS3 for Blu-ray. I also had a Samsung Blu-ray player, one that was about £150, something like that. And then an opportunity came up, a friend of mine upgraded their Oppo Blu-ray player to another brand, and it was a really good deal that he gave me, really good friend. And uh, this Oppo Blu-ray player is fantastic, really nice contrast in like the dark areas, a lot of detail still and just a brilliant, brilliant player. So that's what I've got in my AV setup. Thank you very much for asking. Now, I've also got a question here from Moomin Hamid who asks, hey Dave, love the live stream. Thank you very, very much and thanks for answering my questions. That's cool. I, I enjoyed answering all of the questions in the live stream. Uh, if Apple changed something in its products, what thing would you consider a deal breaker and would ultimately drive you to change to a PC and an Android device? And on the other hand, what would the PC industry, Microsoft and the manufacturers have to change in order for you to leave Apple and get a PC? Well, the first part of your question, what would force me to leave Apple? If the operating system got into a state where it wasn't stable, if they dumbed it down too much and a lot of people previously were predicting that it would really start looking a lot like iOS and lose a lot of its functionality. Well, if the desktop OS ever got to that state, then I don't think it would offer up anything for professionals uh, or uh, sort of creators like myself. So that would force me to look elsewhere as well. But so long as it's delivering what I want, which it has done for the past, what, eight or nine years, something like that, maybe a little bit longer than that, but if it continues to deliver the environment that works for me, then it would take a lot to get me to, to ditch Apple and to leave. Now your other question, what would the PC industry have to do or have to change in order for you to leave Apple and get a Windows based PC? Well, I've got Windows devices, I review Windows devices, it's just not my chosen platform. I think what they would need to do to convince me is to make something a little bit more elegant to use. Um, I was going to say simplistic, but I think what I mean by that is where the outer shell of it is a lot more simplistic and things don't get in the way of my creativity. If they delivered that sort of experience, then I would certainly consider it. The pricing, it goes without a doubt, you can save money by building or buying a equivalent specification PC or Windows based PC compared to a Mac, you do pay a little bit more for Apple products. So the pricing is definitely a good thing. But whenever I've actually used a Windows PC, and I don't want to start a Mac versus PC argument in this video, it's just whenever I've used one, I found that just the operating system and the updates just get in the way of my creativity. And it all comes down to though, really, it's what you're used to. You know, and I'm used to using Mac OS X, so that's why I've kept that as my platform of choice. I'm sure if you took Apple out of the equation and I'd used a Windows PC for the last 10 years, I would be saying exactly the same about a Windows PC, that it works elegantly, doesn't get in the way of my creativity, and it's what I'm used to, and that's my platform of choice. So it's, it's a really difficult topic to cover. But, but yeah, they would, they would just need to make it a little bit more elegant for me. Um, and I do hear a lot of people complaining about having to reinstall Windows and the constant updates. 
uh, and things like that. So that puts me off as well. And in my experience, when I've tested them, things don't just go quite as smoothly for me. But that might be just to, due to my lack of use of that platform because both platforms are equally as good. They both run video editing software, which I would use. They both run Adobe Photoshop and the rest of the creative suite, which I use. They both would handle emails and web surfing, which I use. So there's not really a, a conclusive answer to that. It's you choose something that you're familiar with and that you're happy with the way it operates. So not exactly the sort of answer you wanted or maybe expected, but that's my answer. So there you go. Thank you very much for the question. And that sort of concludes the question and answer session for this weekend. I'm going to end it a little bit early, purely because I've got a sore throat. But thank you very much for all your questions this weekend. If you want to leave new questions, there are details in the video description of how you can get questions to me for next weekend. Uh, I did also cover that off at the beginning of the video. So if you skip the beginning of the video, rewind now and watch the beginning again. That tells you how you can get me new questions. I hope you all had a fantastic one. Hit that like button and I'll see you all again in tomorrow's video. Thanks so much for watching the video. If you'd like to watch another amazing video from me, please do click that top box. And if you want to subscribe to my geeky channel, click the red box on the bottom of your screen now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.